we will now, uh, for the want of time, we'll go on to the next talk. Uh, that is Professor Dr. Uh, N. Gopal Krishnan, who would speak on MGRS. Before he comes up, so out of curiosity, we have done abdominal fat pad aspiration for a few patients, a significant number of patients, and we did not find a single patient being positive. Maybe the site which we choose us may be wrong, actually. I don't know. Maybe the methodology also may be wrong. But as you said clearly, that the person should be uh, doing, person doing the procedure must be knowing how to do and how to stain also is very important. Yes, out of curiosity, we have done. Sir, Dr. Gopalakishnan, sir, please. Hi. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for the organizing team, Professor Mesh Kanna and Professor Mayuri Trivodi and the whole lot of organizing team. The topic for uh, discussion is MGRS, monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. Uh, vague topic, uh, difficult, sometimes difficult to understand and very heterogeneous in nature, in all aspects, pathogenesis, pathology, our understanding the pathogenetic process, and very vague therapeutic options. And it is very easy to misdiagnosis, misdiagnose, as well as miss the diagnosis. Yeah. So this is the definition that has been given for MGRS. A group of uh, disorders, heterogeneous disorders, where there is renal dysfunction, evidence for kidney dysfunction, Secondary to the production of monoclonal immunoglobulin by a clone of B cell or plasma cell which have not assumed the characteristics of being a malignancy. So this is the uh, consensus of the International Kidney and Monoclonal Gammopathy Research Group in 2017. They emphasize that the underlying B cell or plasma cell clones do not cause tumor complications or do not meet any current hematology criteria for specific treatment. So this is the definition. So you need to have an understanding of these three categories, you know, the terminology. On the one side, you know, the frank paraproteinemia that is like, for instance, a myeloma. There is no doubt about the diagnosis. We have the CRAP criteria in the plasma cells, more than 10% in the bone marrow and so on. On the other side, there is evidence for the presence of a clone of BR B cell or a plasma cell, but there is no organ dysfunction. It pretends as if it is just benign, so it does not warrant any therapy that we call it as MGUS of unknown significance. In between these two is this MGRS, where there is a clone of B cell or a clone of plasma cell that is producing an immunoglobulin and that is toxic to the kidney. There is evidence pathologically for that. So this is the understanding. A quick run through of the MGRS associated kidney lesions. You know? It's a nice classification published in one of the articles in KI. On the one side, the organized deposits are inclusions. So there is a toxicity of this, the monoclonal protein, right? On the other side, an organized deposits. The organized deposits are fibrils. The pathology will be like IgG related amyloid, just now we heard, or it can be microtubules. The classical example is your immunotactoid glomerulonephritis and type 1 cryoglobulinemia here. And the crystals, the light chain proximal tubulopathy and the crystal storing histiocytosis. On the other side, the non-organized deposits of the protein, uh, the LCDD, low chain, uh, uh, LCDD and long and heavy chain deposition disease and heavy chain deposition disease and so on. Here comes one very interesting, another vague entity, that is a PGNMID, the proliferative gene with monoclonal immunoglobulin deposits. And of course, the current interest is that C3 glomerulopathy. Whenever we have, we do come across a C3 glomerulopathy, we need to think there can be an underlying paraproteinemia. We'll talk, we'll discuss about that later. So this is a beautiful picture, whatever I have said, beautifully depicted the different parts of the, the nephron, particularly the glomerulus and the tibio, uh, describing the pathology. The one more pathology that has not been included in the previous slide, the thrombotic microangiopathy. As you can see here, uh, some of these paraproteinemias or even MGRS can present as, can induce a thrombotic microangiopathy, that is it. Only the, even, uh, about 10 years ago, when we came to know that immunoglobulins, apart from 
causing kidney injury by direct toxicity and by other mechanisms like inducing proliferation of the cells or activation of the complement, all those things are there. But we never knew that it can undergo crystallization because in the crystals and kidney we have very specific causes and etiologies, you know, like drugs and certain substances and so on. By specific uh, pathophysiological mechanisms in some people, it undergoes a crystallization and that by itself causes a couple of pathologies. The crystal storing histiocytosis, crystal globulin nephropathy, and the crystal induced proximal tubulopathy. So this is the plethora of kidney pathology. So this picture nicely describes the pathophysiology of each pathology associated with MGRS, right? So why crystallization happens? As you can see here, light chain proximal tubulopathy. Uh, what happens is that these light chains, some of them, they have some mutation in them, certain components of it, that makes these mutations make them resistant to proteolysis. So that gets stored up within the tubules, undergo crystallization. So like that, for each uh, pathology, I mean for each entity, there is a pathophysiology here. Look at the, at the down, that is uh, PGNMID. There is entrapment of the monoclonal protein in the glomeruli that causes complement activation and that results in proliferative pathology. These uh, paraproteinemias, they cause kidney injury not just by these pathophysiological mechanisms. Look at on the right hand side, a host of drugs which are being used in treatment of paraproteinemias as well as MGRS. Each one of them have their own renal syndrome that is entirely different topic. So the renal lesions associated with MGRs doesn't stop with the disease process per se. Also treatment related issues also can happen. So how to go about whenever you come across a kidney biopsy where you detect a light chain restriction or a heavy chain restriction. You start suspecting a monoclonal gammopathy. What is the next step? Next step is that serum and urine monoclonal studies like protein electrophoresis and immunofixation that is superior and free light chain assay. And subsequently, you are supposed to confirm you have to go for bone marrow aspirate and biopsy also in certain situations. In situation, if bone marrow is negative and there is a high index of suspicion of lymphoma, then you have to go for lymph node biopsy. On the other hand, if your kidney biopsy reveals a C3 dominance, you have to go for further workup for C3 glomerulopathy. So this is our experience. It is not just MGRS, it's a total experience of paraproteinemias published in, in international reports, Madras Medical College, uh, the host of pathologies. As you can see here, we had 19 MGRS. The pathologies associated with MGRS were light chain deposition disease that tops the list with seven. And this mortality analysis is not, it's overall, I mean, both MGRS as well as myeloma related. It is not a study confined to MGRS alone. Let me go through a, a case vignette, which we recently treated a couple of months ago. Um, a 45 year old gentleman, a known hypertensive, he was doing fine. It is a short history of edema and frothy urine. Evaluation revealed a nephrotic range of proteinuria. Only two to three RBCs, I wouldn't call it as a kind of a classical nephrotic sediment. There was evidence for nephrotic process, hypercholesterolemia, hypoalbuminemia. We sincerely believe that it be yet another case of idiopathic membranes and property. But this is the kidney biopsy. It was a bit surprising. As you can see here, very florid proliferative pathology. It was a diffuse, not just diffuse, almost all glomerulus showed proliferation. And it's a kind of a global proliferation involving endocapillary and mesangial proliferation, a classical proliferative glomerulonephritis. Immunofluorescence was a surprise again. There was only IgG positive, strongly positive. A and M were negative, and there was a light chain restriction. Lambda was negative, kappa was significantly positive. So now you have, yep, of course, uh, we couldn't do electron for this patient. We have a, a very uh, virulent, robust proliferative pathology in the light microscopy, immunofluorescence reveals. So there is every reason for us to conclude that it is PGNMID. Actually, what you are supposed to do whenever you come across only IgG, you are supposed to do IgG isotype also, subtype also. The G1, then only you can prove the monoclonality that could not be done here. So we thought it is PGNMID, proliferative glomerulonephritis with monoclonal immunoglobulin deposits disease. PGNMID, it is not just confined to one particular clinical scenario, one clinical associate. It can happen in multiple clinical, diverse clinical settings. On the one hand, 
a frank paraproteinemia like myeloma can be associated with this. MGRS, it's one of the favorite uh, pathologies. You can have BGNMAD in myelodysplastic syndrome. It can happen as a paraneoplastic phenomena in certain solid tumors like CA lung and so on. There are a host of infections which cause this kind of a pathology where it is only transient and temporary. And once that infection goes off, successful reversal of pathology of PGNMID. Recently also there was a case report, uh, parovirus causing PGNMID like picture. So whenever you come across this kind of a clinical picture of PGNMID, you need to, and of course one thing I have missed out, it can happen along with certain autoimmune diseases as well. So you need to uh, go through the panel complete uh, clinical and uh, laboratory investigations to rule out systematically all these associations before calling it as MGRS. So this is the diagnostic uh, criteria given for PGNMID. The light microscopy, the proliferative pathology, immunofluorescence, a single immunoglobulin class, a single isotype of IgG, but more common is IgG3, most of the situations, and light chain restriction. Electron microscopy, you need to have a gran granular deposits in the mesangial, subendothelial, and or subepithelial locations, and absence of clinical and laboratory evidence of cryo. It's mandatory before calling it as MGRS. Keeping all that in mind, we did all these investigations. There was no hypocomplementemia. C4 was slightly on the lower end of the normal range. The autoimmune profile was negative. Cryo was negative. CT chest and CT abdomen, everything was negative. There was nothing to suggest a solid tumor. Uh, there was no cardiac dysfunction. And serum protein electrophoresis, no M band. Serum immune electrophoresis, again, normal. Serum uh, free light chain, I say was normal, there was no altered ratio. And the bone marrow revealed only 3% of plasma cells. So here we have just only the restriction of uh, the uh, immunoglobulin, but nothing else to prove the clone, presence of clone. In general, how does PGNMID features? Most of them have nephrotic range of proteinuria, about 50% of them. 50% of them have renal failure at presentation itself. And hypertension varying range up to 70%. Hematuria you can have up to three fourths of the patient and hypocomplementemia can happen in up to 40% of the patients. And as noted in the literature, um, the positivity for picking up a clomin M band in a serum protein or urine protein electrophoresis, immunofixation, all this is very, very minimal. Uh, abnormality in the serum uh, free light chain is also only 20% of the patients. That's what happens. And uh, association of PGNMID, most often is MGRS, very rare with myeloma and rarely with lymphoma also it happens. This is a general uh, description in the uh, literature, published literature. There are certain situations, I mean, there are instances, now more and more of uh, our hematologists uh, encourages us to uh, go ahead with further testing to pick up a missed clone or a hiding clone. Normally, conventionally, we do only serum protein electrophoresis, immunofixation, and pre light chain. The newer investigations are from the marrow specimen, you are supposed to run a flow cytometry, even in the peripheral blood flow cytometry and fish fluorescent in situ hybridization. There are instances by these advanced techniques picking up a clone, right? So this is a flow chart as to how to go about. You have to classify clinically and then plan your therapy. Whether there is any detectable clone or M protein in the blood system consistent with renal deposition, if it is yes, you have to go for. Whether it meets the criteria for hematological malignancy and requires treatment, like your CRAP criteria and so on. If it is yes, it is malignancy associated PGNMID, I have to go for chemotherapy, no confusion. If it does not meet the criteria to be branded as a malignancy, it is MGRS related PGNMID. What do you do? How do you treat? Of course, you have to give supportive treatment, empirical treatment. Whether you have to just stop short with conservative treatment or you have to go for chemotherapy, there is a big confusion. I'll talk about that. On the other hand, uh, when there is no detectable clone, like in our patient, whether there are factors contributing to the immune disorder, like infections and autoimmune diseases, all those things, if it is yes, identify, treat them. If it is not there, it, you call it as an unclassified PGNMAD. There also, you have to just give supportive treatment. Whether to go for a definitive treatment therapy is a big question mark. Why we are talking like that? The prognosis is not that good. 20% progress to ESRD in less than one year. So this is one meta-analysis. It is not a very well-powered study because very few patients in each study. The, in this study, uh, it was not a kind of a randomized one thing. No, it's only meta-analysis observation. The cohort of 40 patients who received clone-directed therapy, they fared better compared to 35 patients who were receiving only supportive therapy. Right. 
So, if therapy means, what is the therapeutic option? If it is a B-cell clone, you have to go for rituximab. If it is a plasma cell clone, it's a bartizomib therapy. And recently we heard about the daratumumab. It is suggested in, by more of the others. Anti-CD38 antibody it is supposed to be superior in uh, PGNMID as well. And if no clone is identified, like in our patient, how to go about? You don't know whether it is a B cell or plasma cell. If the biopsy reveals IgG, go for bartizomib. Rarely you can have IgM. In that case only, you take him up. So it, essentially, it is bartizomib-based therapy. So this is a nice guideline, a very nice uh, kind of, a very summary uh, of uh, how to go about in treatment. See, the white boxes, you don't treat, meaning specific therapy is not there. The black boxes, in that situation, you have to go for clone-directed therapy. Uh, the patients have to be classified into A, B, C, D cohorts. A is proteinuria less than one gram and no evidence for progressive disease. You just observe with supportive care, don't do anything. B, proteinuria more than one gram and there is a progressive disease, go for clone-directed therapy. And C, patients, candidates are in advanced CKD and you are contemplating kidney transplant very seriously, you must treat this category. And D, Advanced stage of kidney failure, you are not contemplating kidney transplant, don't treat. Why is it so? So with this, where do our patients stand? Uh, nephrotic range of proteinuria, no renal failure. So A, so we have to treat. Sorry, B, we have to treat. So chemotherapy was initiated with VTD regimen, bortisomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone. And six months after the disease onset, he had completed four cycles already. And what we have achieved is the serum creatinine remains the same. There was reduction in the proteinuria. Clinically, patient is stable. We can just say that the patient's condition is stabilized and the reduction in the proteinuria has been achieved. Why, even in the advanced stage of kidney failure, suppose somebody wants to go for transplant, why we have to treat? Because PGNMID is one condition where there is a very high recurrence rate post-transplant, as high as 90%. And that's why it happens very early, within months after transplant. And the graft loss happens, more than 50% of the graft loss within three years. So it is important that you have to give targeted chemotherapy. And finally, an interesting observation, it is not PGNMID. There was a, one article, nice article, actually five patients with the DDD and C3 glomerulopathy who received Equilizumab. As per protocol of that institution, one year after Equilizumab therapy, they do a kidney biopsy to see what's happening. The initial C3 glomerulopathy is proliferative, proliferation was very prominent at one year still some element of mesangial proliferation was there in the light microscopy. In the immunofluorescence, there was a kind of a M MIDD, like you no know, single heavy chain and single light chain restriction. So the authors were confused whether an MIDD was missed out or C3GN evolves into MIDD. Nothing has happened because we know eculizumab is an engineered molecule. It is engineered in such a way that it has only kappa chain and it is a kind of a chimeric IgG1, IgG2, and IgG4. So it's a kind of an artificially engineered a monoclonal immunoglobulin. So can we call it as pseudo-PG and MAD? With this, I end my lecture.